As long as I'm President of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley. And I am Naz Modirzadeh. Welcome to this new episode of Hold Your Fire. Today we're going to be discussing one of those rare occurrences, a peace process that actually succeeds, the yes. peace process in Colombia. And we really are lucky. We have uh, uh, one of our trustees, former president of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos, who is going to be with us. He was the architect of the peace agreement. And he'll be joined by our senior analyst in, uh, in Bogota, uh, Beth Dickinson. But before we do that, uh, Naz, how was your week? Well, not bad. We're a few weeks away here from the elections in the United States, so a tense period to be sure. But I know there were, as as there have been for the last few weeks, a number of developments around the world that we've been uh, paying attention to. And, and the first I wanted to raise related to the guests we had for the last two podcasts that looks like the ceasefire that we had discussed last week in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, did not hold. And so... It looks like the pessimism expressed by Olesya and Zaur was well-founded, that uh, this conflict seems to be uh, perhaps worsening and certainly doesn't appear to be coming to a close just yet. Yeah, no, as you say, in fact, there's been now, I guess, two ceasefires, one brokered by, by Russia, the other by, by the Europeans, and neither one has held long at all. The, the images coming out both of Nagorno-Karabakh and of Azerbaijan, where the second uh, largest city has been attacked several times. I think what we heard from both Zora and Olesya rings true, however depressing it is, is that this is a war where there is no obvious end point and diplomacy has failed in the past or hasn't really done much. Azerbaijan is going to push it so, as much as it can. The one hope, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty uh, you know, mixed hope, is that at some point Azerbaijan decides it has gained some territory, enough to claim victory, enough to go back to the table with some leverage. And also because it has lost, and we don't know how many, but many of its soldiers, likewise for, for Armenia. So, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. I know there's going to be more efforts to, to resolve this diplomatically, but it may be one of those cases where the conflict ends when one or both parties are exhausted. Yeah, that's right. And speaking of another conflict that uh, has gone on for a tragically lengthy period of time, but where there was a a small glimmer of hope, we saw the exchange of uh, upwards of a thousand prisoners in Yemen uh, this past week, an effort that uh, began with negotiations in Switzerland some years ago, and then I think went through a process of all the parties being unsure whether we would ever see the day of the actual prisoner exchanges, but indeed a dramatic image of many people boarding ICRC planes and being reunited with families. So a sense that sometimes these protracted negotiations and efforts at identifying even small humanitarian solutions might have some kind of an effect on the course of a conflict like this. Yeah, I mean, I guess in some of you know, our motto is to prevent, resolve, but then the third leg is to mitigate the impact of deadly Ah. conflict. Uh, Yemen, obviously, we've been pushing to to resolve the conflict, and we still will, but there are these other steps that matter to so many people. It's the same in Nagorno-Karabakh, by the way. One of the steps that this humanitarian ceasefire was supposed to allow was to retrieve the dead bodies, at least that. And that's the work that the ICRC, the International Committee for the Red Cross, and others do, and it is, you know, we always would like to resolve the conflict, but sometimes the best one can hope for, and even that's difficult, as we've seen in Yemen is at least some modicum of humanity so that the suffering is, is alleviated. Speaking of suffering, I do want to mention something else before we turn to our the main part of the, the podcast. One of my you know dear friends and colleagues, Saab Erekat, who is the main negotiator between Israelis and Palestinians now, for as long as I can recall, as we record this podcast, he's fighting for his life. Uh, unfortunately, he contracted COVID-19. He'd already had a lung transplant because of, of cancer, and he is really fought this, that illness uh, courageously, as I'm sure he's fighting this one. You know, we, we're, gonna, we're about to talk to an architect of, of a peace process in, in, in President Santos. Saab, I hope, I hope he lives to see uh, the fruit of his efforts, which is a peace between Israelis and Palestinians. But regardless, it's, it's almost impossible to think of Israel-Palestine without thinking of him because he's been so uh, omnipresent and I've had so many meetings and conversations with him. 
and you know that we could disagree, but one thing one can never question is his absolute commitment to peace, his absolute commitment to, to a sovereign, independent state of Palestine, living side by side in peace with Israel. So our thoughts are, are with him at, at this time. Hold your fire. A podcast by the International Crisis Group. So I'd like to welcome our two guests today. Uh, first, former President Santos from, from Colombia. He was, as I said, president between 2010 and 2018. He was a Nobel Peace Prize winner and perhaps most important, a trustee of crisis group. Uh, president, thank you so much for making the time. Oh, thank you for having me. And with him is uh, Beth Dickinson, who now lives in Bogota, and she's since 2018 is our senior analyst on Colombia, coming straight from uh, the UAE, where she used to cover conflicts in the Gulf. Beth, great to have you on. Thanks so much. Really appreciate the opportunity. So I'd like to start, uh, Mr. President, with, with one question. You know, we, we deal with conflicts around the world and very, very few breakthrough resolutions in many, many years. Uh, Colombia is one of those rare cases that succeeded. If you had to think of the two things that you thought were key to the success in Colombia, and then we could try to think about whether they would apply elsewhere, what would those be? That's a difficult question, but I, I would mention, uh, first of all, careful planning, and uh, second, building trust. Those two aspects were crucial for the peace process to succeed. Without careful planning, it would have been very difficult. And careful planning uh, means studying other peace processes, studying uh, peace processes that were tried before in my country, and uh, finding the elements that would make a negotiation successful. And uh, building trust is something that is common sense in any uh, negotiation, in any conversation. If you build trust, it's much easier to reach an agreement. And of course, this was, uh, I mean, we sh you should maybe remind our listeners how deadly this conflict was and for how long it lasted. So when you speak about building trust, you're talking about trust among parties, the, the, the Colombian government, the Colombian people, the FARC, uh, the, the main rebel group. You, you first led a military campaign against them before you pivoted or you, you, you worked on the peace process. One may have been essential for the other. But to tell us a bit, I mean, that, that level of distrust and of anger and of you know, hostility between the two, what was it like? It was... Uh a normal situation of having uh, two parties that in a way hated each other, had no trust in each other. And especially in my case, as you just mentioned, well, I led probably the most devastating military campaign against the FARC. So I was really a, one of their top military objectives. But that in a way helped me reverse the situation, uh, find a common ground. Because when I started to have contact with them and I started to lay some very clear rules of the game. They started to understand that I was talking seriously, that I wanted peace. And uh, I also made a lot of efforts to discover or to try them. How serious were they in this uh, specific peace process or Will they do the same thing that they did with my predecessors to use the negotiation to gain uh, political or military power? So it was a period where both of us were sort of trying each other. And uh, I think it was a crucial period because both of us came out of that process with a minimum doses, but sufficient of trust one and the other. President Santos, could I follow up on that to ask, uh, we have in the introduction to our podcast uh, a line that says it, it, it takes a single person to make a war, but a village to make peace. And I know you've quoted before Clemenceau's uh, line that it's easier to make war than peace. I'm wondering, in your experience, did that hold to be true? Was your sense that it was more difficult to establish that trust and use it for uh, the peace negotiations than it was to conduct the, the extended operations against the FARC? Oh, yes, with no doubt whatsoever. Making war needs a very, I would say, simple and easy type of leadership. It's a very vertical leadership. It's one person who's on top. He rallies the forces and he makes war. Making peace you need a more 
horizontal type of leadership. Instead of giving orders, you need to persuade. You need to even persuade not only the enemies, but your own people that peace would be better than continuing war. And believe me, that is more difficult. So yes, uh, by, by all means, uh, I can vouch for that uh, phrase that making peace is much more difficult than making war because I had the experience of making both and I found making peace was much more difficult. But, and I could just uh, jump in on that and ask, ask you, Mr. President, and Beth. So one of the things that, as somebody who was an observer at the time, I was not working on it, that, that came as a bit as a surprise was that, and I, I assume it's, I think you said that it surprised you too, was that the referendum on the peace accords, you lost. I mean, there was a popular referendum and uh, the, the, the vote uh, came out against, which kind of sounds counterintuitive that, it, that whatever skepticism about peace would it pre-exist the agreement I would have assumed should have been overcome by the reality of peace and people want to put it behind them. So were you actually surprised and how do you explain that? And is there anything looking back that might have been done differently for that, so that that first referendum that it might have come out in a more positive way? Yes, if, if I look back, um, I underestimated the power of fake news and I underestimated my adversaries in, in the peace process, not the ones I was negotiating with, but my political adversaries that didn't want me to succeed in the peace process. And they had a very effective propaganda campaign trying to sell uh, the peace process as uh, a process that we would give in to communism. And you have a long list of fake news that we were going to what Trump is using today with Biden the Castro Chavismo, the Venezuela and Castro combined, uh, we were going to, Colombia will become that, and that we're going to do away with private property. And they start to repeat this and repeat it and repeat it. They were so obnoxious in terms of the, the lies that they were just saying to the people that I didn't give that a lot of importance. I said, people will not, are not going to believe that, but they did. And there was one crucial aspect. This is the first peace agreement that has a gender chapter. We thought that uh, among the victims, women are usually the more victims of the victims. So we negotiated a special chapter to give women a sort of a affirmative action in the post-conflict. Well, they managed to sell this gender chapter as something called the ideology of gender which is something that no religion accepts. And the attorney general at that time, very conservative, simply said in one of his speeches that the peace agreement will have an element that will destroy the Colombian families. And uh, the priests and uh, the pastors of the evangelical uh, groups started to campaign for the no vote and when I realized what was happening, it was a bit too late. But afterwards, when we were renegotiating the, the agreement, I brought in the head of the Catholic Church, the cardinals, uh, the bishops, and the evangelical pastors. And I said, here, I give you my pen. Change whatever you want in order to satisfy this worry that you claimed was included in the, in the agreement. And uh, they answered, Mr. President, we are very, very sorry. We were misled by the prosecutor general. We believed him. We have now read the whole agreement, and there is nothing that in a way worries us. So we come here to simply say we are very sorry. But that cost us a lot of votes. <laughs> it's fascinating to hear you were a victim, uh, may have been a victim of fake news before fake news is really something people focused on. But Beth, I want to ask you, uh, so you're, you're in, uh, in Colombia now. I'm sure you speak to a lot of people when, when you can get out of your house despite COVID-19. So when people look back, and I assume that the, the country's still divided, those who oppose the peace agreement and who voted no and who may still feel that it was the wrong thing to do, I mean, do they look back and they, they prefer the, the old days of military confrontation and, and violence? Or what is it about that still triggers some skepticism? Look, I mean, I think today the polarization that um, I think 
came into light, let's say, I think with the referendum. I really like the way that President Santos put it about the difference between vertical leadership and horizontal leadership. And I think in a situation of political polarization, such as the one that Colombia is in today, the easier route is to look for horizontal leadership. And that's exactly what has happened regarding implementation of the peace process and in managing of the security situation after the accord. So what was vital, I think, to, to really put in the accord in place was exactly that horizontal effort to bring communities on board and to create this sort of sense of ownership that really could have made the peace take hold and I think was successful in some areas. And, but unfortunately, as time has gone on, leadership has gotten far more centralized within the government, particularly on this issue. And I think that creates challenges in, in building support for implementation and um, because there isn't this sense of this is our peace process, this is our peace dividend, this is something that's in our hands, but rather this is something that's coming sort of top down. Um, I think also the lack of trust, um, particularly that has developed is uh, between the FARC today and the government is something that really worries us quite a bit. So this FARC, this trust, you know, again, that was so strong during the negotiation of the agreement, I think has slowly started to fracture in large part because of a lack of really a lack of communication, I would say more than anything, and a sense that there isn't the sort of transparency from both sides about the different steps of implementation that there that there needs to be. Um, in order to, to move forward in a collective way in which everyone can stay on board. This is Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Today we are talking with President Juan Manuel Santos and Elizabeth Dickinson. President Santos, could I ask you a question that I'm sure you've been asked a great deal about and thought a great deal about, which is this kind of cliched balance between justice and peace, right? The idea that I've heard it said that there may be tens of thousands of individual claimants in Colombia who would wish to take their cases to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights or other forums and that this was a major source of objection to the peace process was somehow the idea that it was taking away from people the opportunity for, for justice and accountability. How did you grapple with this as you were thinking through the, the shape and the framework of the peace accords? Well, I was aware since the very beginning that that was the most difficult aspect of the whole peace process. Where do you draw the line between peace and justice? And my instructions to my negotiators is seek the maximum of justice that would allow us to have peace. And I knew that no matter where you draw the line, there will always be people from one side and from the other claiming more. This is something that you see in every peace process. You find people that would want and demand much more justice. How is it that you are not taken to jail or not giving 40 years in jail to these commanders who have committed all kinds of crimes against humanity and war crimes. And that is a very politically popular position to have. And in the case of Colombia, this has been taken advantage by the people who were against the peace process since the very beginning and still today are with the same speech. Now, how is it that you have some people that have committed war crimes in Congress? Well, this is why we made the peace process, for them to lay down their arms and continue their fight through democratic and civil means. But m many people take advantage of that and sell the idea that there is impunity. And they, they don't understand, and maybe we have failed to explain enough now, this is the first agreement in the history of the world where a guerrilla or the two parties get together and design a special judicial system and then agree to submit to it. This had never, never been done before. And uh, the system is working. And uh, right now, one of the basic, more fundamental aspects of this special judicial system, transitional justice, is the truth the truth to come out. And of course, the truth sometimes hurts. And many people are not interested in hearing the truth because uh, the truth might not be pretty. 
but this is a fundamental aspect of transitional justice. We are right now exactly in that moment, and we're going through sort of a catharsis uh, that uh, is needed to have reconciliation in the long run. That's, that's really fascinating because that's that you know what you just said. Every conflict we deal with, ultimately, I mean, there are many issues, but this is one of the crux of the matters, which is how do you do justice to justice, but at the same time try to put some of that behind you for the sake of peace and stability, and we confront it every day. But Beth, what are your thoughts? I think, you know, I, and again, this, this actually goes to your question before, too, about what's attractive about the past of, of sort of military conflict is that it was, it was frankly easier. There was a clear enemy. Um, I think, you know, Colombia's conflict, there are many sides to the conflict. There are many different actors who harmed others. And so accepting those individuals as part of the society is very hard, of course, as it would be in, in any country and in any post-conflict situation. But I think the black and white of military conflict, there was a clear enemy that was the FARC. There was a clear, you know, side that was on, on the right, and that was the state. And, and I think there, there is a part of Colombia that misses that clarity today, particularly as the conflict has descended into a bit of a more fragmented state with more micro conflicts, more local disputes, more groups, maybe even less ideology defining those conflicts. It's harder for people to wrap their minds around and particularly in the context of reconciliation. I think it's very challenging to realize that the actor who has been on the wrong side, whoever that may be for so long, is now in the center of the state. If I could build on that and ask a question first to you, uh, President Santos, uh, uh, based on what Beth just said, this idea that it, that in some ways there is a need to perhaps be able to imagine the other and be able to even imagine the enemy in positions that perhaps in our entire lifetimes we haven't contemplated. I, I'm wondering, is your own background as a journalist uh, relevant at all to your ability to have done that, to have called upon the Colombian people to be able to imagine their enemies in different positions and in different roles? Yes, I think um, my experience as a journalist helped. But more than that, it was a conversation that, that I had with a, a general of the Colombian army when uh, I was appointed Minister of Defense. He uh, went to visit me. He was a friend of my father. And he said, I know that you're going to be very effective because you know us. You've been part of us because I was in the military. You've studied us, but you want peace. So I will suggest to you, don't treat the FARC as enemies. Treat them as adversaries because enemies you eliminate. Adversaries, you beat them, but you're going to have to live with them if you want peace. And you are going to have to share with them if you want peace. They're human beings. And uh, that conversation, first of all, gave me a tremendous energy to change the military doctrine in Colombia. Uh, when I arrived, there was the Vietnam body count, which was atrocious. And I changed that upside down. That was one of the reasons I, I had a fight with my president, which was Uribe. But at the same time, I started to, in a way, humanize the war. I told the soldiers, uh, listen, if you respect the human rights, not only of the people, but of your adversaries, they will respect you more. And we started to make very important campaign with the UN human rights people, with the International Red Cross, brigade by brigade, division by division, changing the culture. And that helped us tremendously to win the war. I mean, to take, to come to a situation where militarily the guerrilla said, we will not win, let's negotiate. So that was, for me, very important. So maybe you could tell us, what, what's the first time you had a substantive discussion with the leader of the FARC, and what was it like? What was it about? My first discussion with a top leader of the FARC, a member of the Secretariat, was in Costa Rica. His name was Raul Reyes, who, in an operation that I ordered, was killed many years afterwards. But since then, I was trying to create the conditions for peace. And I remember I asked Nelson Mandela uh, about this Canadian who had helped him bring the people together. His name is Kahani, former executive of Shell. And he has a, a system called the scenario discussions to bring people who don't talk to each other to discuss about different scenarios. 
And so I went to Costa Rica to convince this commander, he was a very important in the FARC, to participate in this exercise. And he was at that time with the daughter of Marulanda, who was the number one, the traditional leader of the FARC. That was the first time I had a conversation. And uh, there's a, a very funny, but and not so funny anecdote. There in Costa Rica, we drank a bottle of wine. And some months afterwards, I was trying to bring the paramilitaries and the FARC to a, a negotiating table. Without asking the government, we wanted to have everything sort of cooked and then tell the government, here's your opportunity. And so I asked President Felipe Gonzalez, he was then president of, of Spain, and our other Nobel Prize winner, Garcia Marquez, for them to be the sort of guarantors of this process. And Felipe Gonzalez said, you bring me written or personal assurances that these people are serious. So I went and I visited the paramilitary leaders, and I was going to visit the leader of the FARC, but they were in trouble with some operations of the army. So I spoke to him and I recorded through a radio telephone. And I said to him, next time, give me a better wine, sort of to break the, to break the, the ice. Well, that was recorded by our military intelligence. I went to Spain and I was in a restaurant with the president of Spain, Felipe Gonzalez, with Garcia Marquez. And suddenly there was a big scandal in Colombia that I was conspiring with the guerrillas to bring down the government. So that's a, a good anecdote about the first time I met a commander who, I must say, was killed in an operation that I led and I authorized. Well, those are, that's a great story. And uh, all these peace processes are very political enterprises, but they're human enterprises and the human interaction matters so much. I want to sort of telescope into the, or jump into the, the present with you, Beth. You've been writing for us about the difficulties of the peace process. You've been telling us about the violence against uh, some of the demobilized FARC members, against the social leaders who played such a crucial role. You've also told me at one point that you, you know, it's important for people to understand this is not a continuation of the old war, it's a new war. So what are the challenges today? What would you say are the main issues that are, that are bedeviling Colombia when it comes to the, the peace process and the aftermath? So I would say that, that one of the major challenges at the moment is really to come to grips with what is the shape of this new conflict. What we've seen over the last few months, and particularly, I would say, accelerated by the dynamics of the pandemic, the lockdown, um, an increase in rural violence, um, essentially what that's made clear is that, again, this is a, a new conflict, but with vestiges of the past. So it's not a clean break. There are symbolisms and uh, historical legacies and even territorial overlap between what's happening today uh, and the previous conflict. But fundamentally, it's a different shape. And it's a different shape because of the actors involved. It's a fund fundamental shape because of the way that communities are responding to that conflict. Um, having been through a peace process and having been promised peace, I think the reaction of communities is much more proactive, perhaps, than it was in the past. Much more willing to put themselves out there and say, this isn't right, something is going wrong in my community, I have the right to peace, I have the right to security, I have the right to development. And that has really changed, um, I think, a lot of the dynamics. So for me, the first challenge really is to come to grips with what is the new configuration of the conflict and what really would be a strategy, first and foremost, a security strategy to manage the dynamics of the current conflict, where you have far more actors that are far more dispersed, that aren't necessarily acting in coordination with one another, that don't necessarily have ideological aims and who are really, more than anything, about trying to dominate territory and do so through dominating communities. What is the security strategy that could manage that situation in a way that safeguards peace and puts the communities who are most affected by that conflict at the forefront? So this is the second challenge, I think, which is complying and, and meeting the requirements and, and the expectations of what was promised in the peace accord. It, it's a big accord. Mr. President, you left a very big number of tasks on, on the desk of, of Colombia, and that's good. And that's, it's a route forward. That's a huge advantage for Colombia because there are steps to follow. Following those steps is extremely difficult. It's going to be even harder now uh, with the pandemic, with resources stretched, with the ability to act on the ground um, even more compl complex than it was previously. But I would say prioritizing that key goal of transforming the territory where 
conflict has persisted for so long is really vital because otherwise you you end up in a cycle where despite perhaps disarticulating one armed group, another one pops up in its place because you have economic desperation, because you have the lack of opportunities, because you have a culture of, of persistent conflictivity. All of these things will continue to cycle until there are clear pathways forward, particularly for rural Colombia, to be more connected with the rest of the country economically, socially, politically, more than anything. Beth, can I ask you a quick follow-up on this? Uh, w- can you say more about this point regarding the shift of groups that are not connected to or aren't fighting out of a sense of ideology? It sounds like your sense is that may make breaking this current cycle more difficult. Can you say a bit more about what you mean and why? Sure. So after many years of having sort of one dominant actor in the conflict, which was, of course, the FARC, Today, there really is no singular group that can say that it has a a hold on the most territory um, other than the state. The ELN is probably the the next largest group at the moment, and they do have an ideological drive. And and I think, you know, a negotiation with them is, is something that very much will have to be on the table at some point in order to end the conflict with them particularly. But elsewhere in the conflict, the other actors are essentially a conglomeration of groups that have fragmented from previous demobilization attempts and from new recruitment. So the first would be post-paramilitary groups. These are groups that came out of the demobilization of the paramilitary process and essentially act today in what we might recognize as drug cartels. The second sort of box, I'd say you could say, of actors would be so-called dissidents of the FARC. Now, this is a bit deceptive because the vast majority of these supposed dissidents were never in the FARC pre-peace. They are new recruits. And more than anything, the way that these groups operate is based on the individual agendas of commanders in a specific area. So rather than operating as, you know, the FARC or FARC dissidents under a singular umbrella, um, they are really all after their own self-interests. And those self-interests vary dramatically from region to region. They've even competed with one another in certain areas for space and territory. Mr. President, so your, your, what are your, maybe this will be the last question, your reflections on where your country is today and what you just heard from Beth? I agree with what Beth has just said, but I would add the following. The peace agreement with the FARC has been working quite well. Roughly 90% or more of the FARC members that demobilized and gave up their arms are right now accounted for and in the process of reintegration. And so what you call the DDR, demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration, that has been done, I think, uh, in a very short amount of time compared to other peace processes. The problem is that we were very ambitious in the peace process, and we wanted much more. For example, what uh, Beth is mentioning about the areas that were in conflict for so many years uh, that need social development and need the presence of the state. We negotiated 17 different development plans, and in a way that uh, was unprecedented, the communities were the ones who would establish their priorities in each region. And this was a, a process that took about two years, a very beautiful democratic process. What has happened, unfortunately, is that this government and we have to say it, made a campaign against the peace process and uh, the party that supports this government, still many of them don't like the peace process and would like to abolish the peace process. Just a few days ago, my predecessor, when he was liberated from his house jail, said that he wanted a referendum to do away with transitional justice, which means do away the peace, with the peace process. So we have a political situation and the polarization of the country has been around this issue, the peace, which is a a bit irrational. We could very well agree on the implementation of the peace process and start and continue fighting for other issues. But no, this is something that for them has been politically profitable, and they want to continue with that flag. Fortunately, this is backfiring. And uh, we saw that in the last regional elections, and we will see it in the next elections. Uh, This will backfire. And uh, I am quite optimistic that regardless of the problems that we're having, and I think the most difficult problem is the assassination of the social leaders. 
and uh, the former FARC members by different groups with different interests. They are not ideological. They are criminal groups that have different interests. And there you need a much more effective state, a much more effective government. And what has been lacking, in my view, is the political will to implement the agreement with more determination. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to really thank you for your time for these uh, for these words. Uh, and I would you just mentioned the assassination of social leaders, as I said earlier. Uh, we issued a report maybe a week or two ago just on that issue, which I recommend our, our, our listeners turn to. But thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Beth. And we will have much to reflect upon uh, from what you just said. Thank you. Thank you. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Rob, this brings us to the segment where you tell us what we should be reading that's been published by the Crisis Group this week. Yeah, well, first I want to say, uh, Naz, I thought that conversation with President Santos and Beth Dickens was really fascinating. I mean, that, those personal aspects. So the first thing I want to recommend is not something that we published. It's a book, which you may have read, Say Nothing, which is about the peace process in Northern Ireland. And the reason I say it is that so much of what we heard today, the difficulty of putting matters behind for the sake of peace and the search for accountability, but also something else which was a bit implicit in what we were hearing is, you know, in that case, it was the, the IRA that, that had to stop fighting. And so many of their fighters then had to deal with the fact that they had killed and hadn't achieved all their objectives. And it was traumatic for them. It's a fantastic book. But turning to, to Crisis Group's publications, too, that a reader should, should look at, one on Thailand and the extraordinary wave of protests. I mean, the images are ex really something, particularly given a history of repression by the military, and the fact that the protesters, some of them at least, are breaking one of those taboos that hadn't been broken, which is questioning the monarchy. We have a question and answer that answers whatever question you may have about uh, why, why these protests are ongoing. And secondly, a briefing on the forthcoming elections in Myanmar and the dangers in the majority rule, the, 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 the kind of majority rule, the kind of winner-take-all elections that have not given voice to some of the ethnic groups and could fuel more violence and more conflict. And that's, that's another one that uh, I recommend to our readers. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Rob. And uh, again, we recommend those uh, to our listeners. So I should tell our listeners, Naz, that you're going to be taking a few weeks off from the podcast, but you'll be back very soon and uh, we'll miss you until then. Yes, indeed. And I'm looking forward to coming back uh, back soon. In the meanwhile, I wanted to thank the crisis group team that was responsible for putting this podcast together, as always, to encourage you to leave ratings or reviews if you're listening to us on iTunes, and also to encourage you to send any questions you may have about this week's podcast or ideas for future topics to media at crisisgroup.org. Have a good week, everyone. Hold your fire a podcast by the International Crisis Group.